uh, I am Gabor Horvath, and I will talk about, uh, well, not compilers, but uh, some fun fact for those who, uh, who are not into compilers. Compilers are awesome, and they are everywhere. Even when you wouldn't even think about it, they are, they are for example, in big data frameworks, browsers, GPU drivers, and uh, probably uh, when you start to study uh, compilers, you will encounter the common architecture that uh, most of them shares. But uh, in reality, even though compiler is uh, one of the main tool of a developer, it is not the only tool we are using. And when we are uh, making tools, we would like to reduce work. So for example, in LLVM, we have a common optimizer that uh, multiple uh, language frontends and multiple uh, backends uh, can use. But uh, when we are working uh, on software projects, we are usually using whole tool chains and not just the compiler. So uh, when I think about uh, compiler, uh, I mostly think about not just the tool that translates the code into executable format, but also uh, all the parts of the tool chain. So in this talk, I would like to walk you through some of the, some, of, some parts of the tool chain that some parts of some of the tools that you should have in your tool chain, uh, but uh, it is it is only scratching the surface. So first of all, uh, let's see some examples. So what do you think? What will what will be the output of this? program, and uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask you that because that would take a lot of time to, uh, to ask a guess each time, but I think you should really try to guess something as a, as an exercise because, uh, then it is easier to remember the results. And basically, uh, here I'm trying to use uh, two compilers and I'm getting uh, two different imp imp uh, outputs. And of course, the reason is that uh, this program contains undefined behavior. So as you can see, if the program has undefined behavior, uh, different compilers can produce uh, different outputs, which is not too great. But also, for example, uh, if, you, if you look at another another uh, code snippet. We have a function here and an infinite recursion. And let's see what it does when we compile and run this program. And if we just compile and try to run this, we will get a segmentation fault because we use up all of the stack. But if we turn on optimizations, then we, in fact, get an infinite loop. So as you can see, the behavior of the program uh, can vary when we use the same compiler, but we are using uh, different uh, flags to compile the same program. And also, uh, if we look at what the compiler do, it, it do much, much more than just translating the programs to executables. For example, in this example, you can see uh, I have a recursive implementation of the factorial function. And uh, if I turn on optimizations, the compiler won't even generate the code to call into this function because in this particular case, we know the input of this function at compile time and we can calculate the results at compile time. So basically, we need tools to deal with all the complexity uh, of the 
language and the problems that we face. And the problem is not the undefined behavior, because if we would, if we would define everything, then uh, we could have much, much fewer optimizations. So basically, the solution is to, part, to find what causing undefined behaviors in our programs, and we need tools for that. So let's, let's have a motivating example. Why, why is it really hard to debug undefined behavior? So this is a small code snippet. We have an array, and we increment each element of the array. But uh, the bounds until we increase the elements is, uh, is a runtime uh, command line argument to this program. So let's see what happens if we provide this uh, executable with uh, multiple options. So first, uh, when I give five uh, as an argument, five is the length of this array, so no undefined behavior. When I give six, uh, there is undefined behavior in this program, but uh, the result is the same as one would expect. And if I give 10, I get illegal instruction after printing hello. If I give like 1,000, then I will get a segmentation fault after printing hello. And if I give a much bigger number, I will get a segmentation fault before printing hello. So the same program compiled with the same compiler flags, but uh, having the same data, having different data can uh, provide a very different behavior when it should provide the same. And also, the part of the code that uh, breaks is different. So sometimes hello is printed, and we can see the effect of the undefined be behavior after hello is printed. And sometimes we see the effect of the undefined behavior immediately before hello even is even printed. So uh, as you can see, this is only a very small code snippet. And you can imagine if we are working with large projects, which consists of uh, several millions of lines of code, it's much harder to find issues like this or issues that are more complicated than that. So basically, it is very scary. And this kind of undetermination may make it very, very difficult to detect all of the instances of uh, such errors. So there is a great blog post that I think you should uh, definitely read. It's about uh, undefined behavior. And it will go through some of the most common undefined behavior that can cause us uh, headaches, and also enumerates a large number of mitigation techniques, what you can do to basically avoid or avoid these errors or find them if uh, they already happened. OK, so let's look at some tools uh, that we can use to basically eliminate uh, these errors or find them as early as possible. And static analysis is one of, one, one of the possible ways to find these problems. And static analysis is basically analyzing the code without running it. And uh, we can use uh, this technique for uh, a lot of tasks. And uh, one example is code formatting. So how many of you are familiar with the uh, Clang format? Almost everybody. So I will do this uh, demo very quickly. So basically, what is really great about Clang format, it can reflow all your comments and string literals and uh, and it does and it respects macro definitions so basically when it reflows a long string literal inside a macro uh, the dashes the the so it will be a multi line macro statement so basically uh, it will not break your Code. And also, it is pretty handy when you are 
uh, reformatting your functions. For example, let's just make this parameter a little bit shorter. And then it will save you a lot of time. You do not need to actually like uh, uh, hitting the keyboard all the time to deal with white spaces. So it's a huge productivity boost, so you can spend more time debugging. And also, uh, you will be a much happy, happier developer, and uh, you will probably implement less bugs then. So this is a great tool, but uh, let's go on. Warnings are great, and you should have them enabled. And also, you should keep your build clean. And while warnings are great, there are some information that you can provide uh, about your code to the compiler. So the compiler can be even more uh, efficient finding errors for you. So for example, non-null is one of the possible annotations that you can uh, give to the compiler. And actually in Clang there are multiple ways of doing so. So the first uh, fetch function is about... Uh, so in the first fetch function, the compiler will warn you if you uh, act, pass a null pointer to this function, or the static analyzer that understands this annotation can warn you in more complicated cases than this but the compiler will not optimize the code based on the fact this function cannot be passed uh, with a uh, null pointer. But in case you use the non-null attribute, like in fetch2, then the compiler will use this information to optimize your code. So basically, uh, depending on whether uh, you are convinced that uh, this will not break your code base, you can use either of the options, and it will help you find bugs earlier uh, using uh, warnings or static analysis. But if you are using the second one and you make the compiler optimize based on uh, this fact, basically what used to be a soft undefined behavior, and by soft undefi undefined behavior I mean that it's undefined what the library does in this case, it might have a defensive early return and then nothing really bad happens. You turn it into a hard undefined behavior before, because from now on the compiler will use the fact that null pointer cannot be passed to this function to optimize the code. So if you pass null pointer to this function, the compiler might remove that code because it will assume that uh, that uh, code will never be executed. So it's a very big difference between these two annotations. And uh, there are also many uh, standard annotations that are really awesome and I think you should use, like no discard, deprecated, fall through, and also thread safety annotations in case you are working with a, a concurrent code. So, and th these are like compiler checked comments. So you could document these facts using comments, but uh, but they might, uh, they, they wrote with the code. So the comments wrote independent of the code, and the code and the comment might contradict each other, but uh, these, these uh, annotations uh, are basically part of the code. So this, this is what makes it so great. Okay. So let's look at another great static analysis tool uh, called Clang Tidy. How many of you used Clang Tidy before? I think you should start use it uh, as soon as possible. This is this is a this is a code example. It contains a lot, but let's look at what Clang Tidy does with this this piece of code. So I will, I will run some checks on this code, and I will ask Clang Tidy to transform this code. So actually, in, in case Clang Tidy finds some issues, that it can transform into something uh, 
that it can transform the code um, to a form that is better in some ways, it will do that. So just for the record of, uh, just for the recording, I will show the command line, but it is no point to do this, no, no point to know this by heart. It, is, it has a pretty good documentation, to, so you can look it up how to invoke this, and also a lot of the IDs have great uh, plugins for Clank Tidy. Okay, so let's look at what Clank Tidy did here. For example, we used to have a string literal that was very ugly, and Clank Tidy transformed it into a raw string literal that is much nicer. We used to have a set with a with a custom comparison, and Clank Tidy transformed it into a transparent functor. So we do not need to repeat the type. We used to have a ugly loop that Tidy transformed into a range-based for loop. We used to have a deprecated auto pointer, which was transformed into a unique pointer, which used to repeat the type at the new expression. Tidy eliminated this, so we do not we no longer repeat the type. We used to have a redundant null check before a delete. Deleting a null pointer is a no op, and tidy eliminated that for us. We used to use the, uh, the zero literal for null pointers. Tidy transformed this into a null PTR. And also, um, also, we used to have a very ugly use of the ternary operator that tidy just uh, removed, and also we used bind, which was replaced by using a lambda function. So as you can see, it can do a lot to make your code cleaner, safer, faster. And this is just some of the checks I showed you here. It can do much more than that. It was some examples I picked for whatever reason. I, I thought some of them was pretty cool. Okay, so. Clank Tidy can find code smells, performance problems, and refactor your code. And also, it can help you modernize your code. If you introduce a new standard in your, uh, into your code base, you can use Tidy to automatically rewrite some of your code to use the newest language and standard library features. And I think this makes this tool uh, very, very useful. Okay, and let's also look at the static analyzer. So Clank Tidy works on the syntax tree generated by the compiler. Uh, so it can do very handy stuff, but it cannot really reason about the values of the variables, and it do not do very deep analysis. Static analyzer do a much deeper analysis to catch uh, logic errors and other problems in your code, but it comes with a price. For example, uh, it is much slower than compilation, and also um, it sometimes has false positives. So this is a piece of code that I will check with static analyzer, and the question is how many memory leaks are there? in this code? And the answer is, it depends. It depends on what this function is doing. Because in case this function is freeing the memory it was passed, then the only memory leak is here in the function g. Because here I do not uh, free the memory that was allocated by this function. So in order to understand how many memory leaks do we have, we need knowledge from other translation units. Unfortunately, currently, the Clang Static Analyzer cannot reason about the code that is in another translation unit. So when we analyze this code using the Static Analyzer, it will tell us about one of the memory leaks, but it cannot be sure about the other one because it has no knowledge about the function f. 
so it will not report it to avoid false positives. So, so this is this is good that uh, it didn't report any false positive, but bad because we cannot trust it to find all of the errors. But also something else is important. If you look at main, you can see that G was never executed. We never called G. So static analyzer can also find issues in code that we never executed. That's one of the advantage of advantages of static analysis. Whereas when we do dynamic analysis, we cannot find this problem because if a function is not executed, then we couldn't check it. Okay, so so that's that's about the Clang static analyzer. Okay, there is another tool called CPP check, which is less precise than the static analyzer, but it is very, very easy to use. The Clang static analyzer is using the compiler to infer data about your code, so it needs uh, the exact compilation commands in order to be able to understand the code. But uh, the CPP check is a uh, CPP check has its own parser, which is uh, very, um, which is not very strict. It can even parse C++ code without some of the headers being available. So uh, it has a very low barrier to start to use this tool. But uh, of course, this comes at the cost because there are ambiguities. So. Okay. Let's see. So this is the code that I will analyze using CPP check. And one of the reasons I picked this because this is something that the Clang static analyzer cannot find. So what I want to emphasize is that uh, there is no strict ordering between these tools. There are some errors that the Clang static analyzer cannot find, but CPP check can. And there are some errors that the CPP check cannot find, but the Clang static analyzer can. So the more tools you use, the better, basically, if you have enough uh, time budget to deploy these tools and look at the results. So if we run CPP check, on this tool, we will get two null dereference uh, errors. So either, either there is a null dereference or the comparison or this comparison when we compare P to null is redundant. So the code is basically inconsistent. And one of the result for null dereference was this line and one of the other result was in the sixth line, which is this one. So the question is how CPP check knows that this function does not handle null values. And the answer is that we can uh, give CPP check a configuration that tells CPP check a lot of useful information about the functions that we have in our application. So basically, the more information we provide, the better res results we will get. So if you have time to annotate your APIs using this uh, language, then basically it's, a, it's an XML, it's in an XML format, then you can get pretty useful results from CPP check. And uh, if you, if you, are if you are maintaining a library, for example, within a company, and you are annoyed that uh, all of the users are calling that function with a null pointer, and they, not, they are not supposed to, maybe one of the, maybe it is a good, uh, good solution to mitigate this problem a bit by providing a description of the function like this and using CPP check on the user code, so they can use this to catch errors. Okay. So let's move to the sanitizers. How many of you used 
any of the sanitizers. Okay, it's about half of the audience. There is a great talk about the sanitizers that uh, you might want to watch. I'm not going to do uh, that detailed overview of them than this one, but I will do a quick demo. Okay, so maybe you remember this code example. Uh, I told you that uh, we cannot find the error in function g, the memory leak, because we do not execute function g. So let's see that. But we can find the other problem. We can find that the function was not freed by f because during dynamic analysis, we have all the information we need about the code that we are executing. So we do not have the same limitations that we had with the static analyzer. We have a different set of limitations. So the point is that you do not need to choose whether you are into static analysis or into the dynamic analysis. Uh, these two are two different tools and better to have both of them in your toolbox because they can find different issues, they have different strengths, they have, di have different weaknesses. Okay, and also, uh, for example, you can find race conditions using the thread sanitizer. Here I am using uh, two threads to basically sum up the contents of a vector, but I do not synchronize. So there is a race condition between the two threads when I'm accessing the same memory. And when I'm running this with thread sanitizer, I will got a very detailed output what is going wrong using using, uh, and, and which thread did what. And UBSEN is great because UBSEN can find undefined behavior. For example, different sets of undefined behavior, of course, not all of them. For example, when there is a signed integer overflow. So it is it's great to use them. But there are also some very uh, serious limitations of the sanitizer. So let's look at them. Here we have two out-of-bound accesses. And the first out-of-bound accesses, the first out-of-bound access is out of the bound from the inner array, because we have a two-dimensional array. And the second is out of the bound of the whole array. So let's look at what the Let's look at what the address sanitizer does. So basically, it, it is it able to find it, the second one when we are addressing something that is outside of the whole two-dimensional array, but it will not find the first one when it is outside of the inner array, but it, will, that, but it is still within the whole array. So basically, what address sanitizer does, it only checks if you are writing or reading valid memory. But when you are writing or reading valid memory, that still can be out of the bounds, but you might just end up in another piece of valid memory. So basically, it will not find all of the bugs that you are looking for. It's better than some of the tools like Wallgrind because Wallgrind cannot really check errors, check for most of the errors that happens on the stack. So still an improvement, but not a silver bullet. And also, if you compile this code using all the optimizations and then run this, Address Sanitizer will not find any bugs in this code. Why? Because if you look at this code, you can see that basically this 
these writes to the memory are dead. So I'm writing values to the memory and I never read that region of the memory in this program. So what the optimizer will do, it will remove these writes to the memory. So because these writes to the memory are removed, there are no errors to catch. So basically this is an incorrect program that contains undefined behavior, but due to optimizations, we are not able to find those errors regardless of using dynamic analysis. So dynamic analysis and optimizations are not the best friends. So this is something that is great to be aware of. So let's imagine there is a next commit that makes use of this, um, that makes use of this memory region, but some, in some non-obvious ways, and then our code, which will not link because I did not provide the, just a second. Don't do live demo, demos, that will, be, that will go wrong. I will just add another file. Let's see. Okay, and now you can see that also the invocation where optimizations were turned on now fails because the change in the code uh, will um, prohibit the optimizer to remove those writes from uh, to the memory. So the point the point is even if you checked your code with the sanitizers, and you change some unrelated part of your code that are unrelated to the errors, then in the next run, you might find new errors because these changes have some kind of uh, interference with how the optimizer works and that have some kind of interference with how the sanitizers work. So basically, what this tells you you need to run the sanitizers as often as possible because even the change you might think is unrelated can be pretty much related. So this, this is kind of a guideline that I can give you on this topic. Okay, let's... Yes, and, and some of the sanitizers can be run together. So for example, you can use UBSEN together with the address sanitizer. And unfortunately, not all of the not all of the platforms are supported. Okay, so dynamic analysis need co coverage. So, how do you know that uh, you well tested your code? One of the way to have some kind of uh, number to tell you something about uh, how well you tested your code is is to measure coverage. Uh, I'm not telling you that uh, coverage is everything because I, I think there are sometimes functions that do not need to be covered with test, for example, a getter or a setter or something like that. But of course, uh, some people would disagree. And there are some great tools to measure coverage. And I think you should do that. I will not do a de demo this time because we can save some time. Okay. Sometimes we write performance critical application. Uh, sometimes we write security uh, critical applications, and optimizations can uh, hurt us there as well. For example, let's look at this example. For example, we might have a private key in the memory, and we would like to get rid of that private key as soon as possible, so no malicious uh, user could just access this memory area and get this data because it is sensitive. So there is a function consume which does something with this private key, and then we would like to uh, eliminate this private key from the memory using memset. And as you can see, if I compile this in the assembly output, there is a call to memset until I turn on optimizations. And then 
there is no longer, no longer code generated for, MEMS, for, from, for the MEMSET calls. So as far as the compiler is concerned, we are writing memory that we are never reading again. So we do not change the behavior of the program if we just remove this, uh, if we just remove this line of code. So basically, the compiler will try, the compiler is benign, the compiler try to help us and try to make our code faster. But unfortunately, in this case, it also makes it more insecure. So this is just one example. There are a lot of other cases where, where an optimization can hurt us pretty bad when it comes to security. And to this particular example, the solution is sometimes uh, the providers of the platform or the tool chain will give you some special function that will not be eliminated by the compiler and you should use that. But if your platform doesn't, does not provide you with something like that, there is a workaround. You could have a pointer to a function and make this pointer volatile and then you can call memset through this pointer and this works because, because of being volatile, the compiler will assume that the, any, at any time during the execution, this, func this function pointer could be changed to another function, and that other function might have a side effect. So if that function has a side effect, for example, printing to the, uh, printing to the console or something like that, then eliminating that function call would change the observable behavior of the program. So basically, uh, this trick uh, can help you to, to be sure that the function call is not eliminated. People used to do other things. For example, people used to use a function pointer, and they used to define that function pointer in another translation unit. But that's not a correct solution because as soon as you enable link time optimization, then the call will be eliminated again. So it is, it is not, a, not an easy topic to just uh, get rid of this calls. OK. So fortunately, compiler developers were thinking about these issues. And compiler developers provide us with a lot of great tools to do hardening. And these hardening tools have very low overhead. So probably if your application is performant enough, you, sh you might want to, you might, uh, you might would like to consider introducing some of these flags into your uh, compilation chain, and there is a great blog post about how to do hardening using Clang. And uh, yeah, so I think it is way better to have a 1% performance drop than a security breach, but of course it depends on the domain you are in. And also, sometimes we need extra uh, testing to be able to uh, get rid of bugs and coverage, and, and in order to increase the coverage. And one way to increase the coverage is to generate tests, and there is a fuzzing technique, which is coverage guided, uh, and it uses a genetic algorithm. And there is a great talk about this, uh, where they can uh, demo that it, it is it able to find a hard bleed uh, the hard bleed vulnerability within minutes. And you want to be able to find as much, as many bugs as possible, so you would like to fuzz uh, something that has sanitizers turned on. So uh, I did an experiment. I used to have a, an assignment at the university. We had to write an interpreter for lambda calculus. You can see because this something like a dynamically typed language that is very similar to Haskell. And uh, so basically, I wrote this interpreter. And 
it passed all of my test, tests and also it passed all of the tests of the professor and it was accepted and uh, I got the best possible grade. But let's see what happens if I try to fast that. So basically I have some test cases and I have this executable and if I feed this my test cases, all, all of them all of them seems to work. Of course, uh, I and also the professor had a lot more of these, but also, so I, di I decided to introduce a fuzzer and just, I just want to show you how much effort did it uh, require to introduce a fuzzer in this example. Sometimes, of course, it's much more complicated, but all the fuzzing logic is this function which is which fits on fits on the screen so basically it didn't require that much effort depending your application in, in case you need to fast structure data you need to implement custom mutators maybe you would like to use a, a protobuf based fuzzing fuzzing because that uh, help, that helps you uh, fast structured data, but some of the cases, uh, this is very low effort. So, let's run this, and I don't know what's going to happen because it's really a randomized algorithm, so let's, let's hope it, it will find something. And let's go back to the presentation. So basically, uh, when, when we are doing fuzzing, we are looking for crashes. And for this reason, it is really hard to test correctness. Is the output you got from the fuzzed executable correct or not? Uh, it's hard to tell. You can either introduce like semantics preserving transformations uh, into the genetic algorithm that the fuzzer is using and this way check for behavioral equivalence and you can uh, also state all of most of your invariants in the program like asserts and hope for an assertion failure in case something is going wrong so using a lot of asserts in the code and fuzzing together is a good idea and also uh, the way it works, the way it tries to increase the coverage uh, makes this uh, fuzzing best suited to work with uh, deterministic applications. Okay, it's still running. Okay, let's, let's continue with this. So PGO is profile guided optimization. Uh, usually when you run the, when, when you run the compiler, the compiler tries to get some well-educated guess about how frequently a branch is taken or how frequently a loop is executed and using this guess for the cost models and using this to do transformations that make your code faster. And instead of these guesses, you could provide the compiler with runtime statistics, which will make a which will make the compiler ever more precise when they are doing, when we, they are calculating these uh, cost models. So basically, uh, this will mean uh, you will get faster executables, and sometimes uh, the difference can be quite significant. So I think you should definitely uh, try this. You can either use sampling, which is a lower overhead method to get the statistics or you can use instrumentation which has higher overhead but uh, to get the statistics but also it is more precise and also there is LTO which is link time optimization so the optimizer when the optimizer can reason about the code in a larger units not just one translation unit not just one object file but also about the whole program, then it can do much more transformations and it can, it can uh, 
of course, it will also take more resources to reason about larger units of the executable, but uh, it will produce better results. So, okay, it looks like uh, the father found something. So it, it is the example it found, and if I test this, it will indeed crash my executable, and I was able to find that, um, I, I was able to find this uh, misbehavior of this executable because I, was, I added an assert, so I stated my invariance within the program, so that can help you a lot when you are doing fuzzing. Okay, so let's go back to the big picture. So how, what, in my view, in my viewpoint, so this is this is kind of opinionated. So this is what I think uh, how you should build your um, projects. Basically, I think you should keep you should turn most of the warnings on and keep the build clean. I think you should automate the formatting. So, for example. Uh, in my experience, if you are doing code reviews, a lot of the time of the reviewer can uh, go to like pointing out formatting issues, and when you are arguing over formatting issues, maybe you do not uh, have. Maybe, maybe, so we have a limited attention span. How how long can we like really really think about something? So if we use that budget for arguing over formatting issues, then we, we might miss more important problems. So this is really a big game changer when it comes to reviews. Also, you sh I think you should use sanitizers a lot, and also you should measure the coverage, because if you do not know what your coverage is, then you have no idea how well tested your program is. Of course, you do not need to aim for 100% coverage. That makes no sense. But the point is to cover the critical parts of your code that makes sense to be covered. Use static analysis tools. The more, the better. And either fix the warnings or mark them as false positives. And also, using refactoring tools to moderni modernize your code, you can make it easier to understand both for you and your colleagues and also for the compiler, because sometimes uh, more modern C++ can help the compiler better to catch issues or optimize the code. And also, uh, if you have mission-critical parts in your projects, it is a really good idea to use fuzzing, especially if, if it is also security-critical. And if you are running LT, if you are running LT and PG on release builds, you get more performance. And how should you use this performance budget that you just got? Maybe you can add new features, or maybe you can turn on certain hardening features of the compiler. So without losing any performance, you can get a safer application that is better for your user. And also, uh, in case you care about static, anal uh, static analysis, you might take a look at uh, CodeChecker, which is a great tool to track false positives and uh, have a differential view about, uh, so for example, what uh, new findings were introduced in a new release. Okay, it looks like we still have a bit of time, so I will I would like to show one more example, which is about strict aliasing. So oh. this code snippet is not mine. Uh, it is from the blog post I linked on the slides. So basically, uh, there is a pointer to an integer and a pointer to a long. And long and integer, two distinct types. 
and the compiler is reasoning about this. So these pointers are pointing at two distinct types, so they cannot point to the same memory. So we store 0 to x and 1 to y, and then return what we store to x. And we then pass the same, pass a pointer to when both of the arguments are pointing to the same memory region. So let's see what will happen. So both, both when we use GCC and both when we use Clang, when we turn on optimizations, the, comp the result will be zero. And when we turn them off, the result will be one. The reason is that the load from the memory will be eliminated when we return the value pointed by X when we turn optimizations on. So basically, um, this is the this is so the reason behind this is that the compiler is reasoning about the aliasing of pointers using type information, and this is very important because lots of the so when the compiler does an optimization, it first has to do some legality checks. Is it legal to do this optimization? Will it break your code? And a lot of the times it will, the questions it will ask about your code, whether two pointers can be aliased or not. And having that, using the type information to answer this question can enable a large vari variety of optimizations. So having this, having this kind of uh, analysis in the compiler is very useful. But unfortunately, a lot of the codes, codes out there are using costs that will violate these uh, optimization uh, preconditions. So basically, lots of, lots of the large projects, for example, the Linux kernel, have this, have this kind of analysis turned off. So the compiler will not produce incorrect code for the certain cases. So basically, uh, so basically, the produced executable is much slower because we are not confident that no issues like this will happen. So it would be great if we had a tool to catch alias, catch uh, these type types of issues when we are uh, having. A cast that is basically violating these strict aliasing rules. And fortunately, there is a tool under development called Type Sanitizer that is, that is doing just that. As far as I know, it is not accepted into uh, mainline uh, LLVM repositories yet, uh, but it is already under review. There are still some uh, to-dos that needs to be sorted out. And uh, there is a talk from the last uh, LLVM dev meeting about the type sanitizer. Um, this talk is very technical, so I only recommend this in case you would like to know how this is implemented. So thank you for your attention, and I think we still have a little time for questions. So you recommended uh, automatic refactoring and uh, also static code analysis tools. Uh, two points, how many um, problems do you expect to be introduced by this automatic refactoring? Mm -hmm. So that's not for sure. And the other thing is that some, the company I'm working at uh, tried to introduce uh, static code and this on a large scale and it was kind of a fail because we just drowned in false positives. So I don't think there was any payoff. Yes, exactly. So 
th these tools are usually not proven correct. That would be very hard uh, based on the f fact that how complex C++ is. So it can definitely happen that uh, one of the transformations it does uh, is not correct. So in case you are doing large-scale refactoring using these tools, you still need to review the changes that this, these tools are making. But if you have your code, if you want to have your code refactored anyways, uh, it's still less effort than reviewing all those changes than doing all of them manually. So basically, it's not a silver bullet that you push, push a button and then magically all your code uh, will be uh, using the new standard and uh, have the same meaning. It is something that you still need to review, unfortunately, but it is still better than, than doing by hand. But uh, what I also would like to point out that uh, changing uh, to, the, to a newer standard uh, when you are updating your code base is uh, not a trivial task because even if you do not introduce any changes to your code, just by flipping the switch, which standard to use, the semantics of the code might change. It is, it is possible to write code snippets that will have different outputs when you are compiling them using different standards. And uh, basically, yes, that's it. So you will need to audit what the tool does, and you also need to audit what your application does after raising the standard version. Hi. I have a short question concerning the strict aliasing example. I was wondering, um, the compi compiler seems to see all the code in this file here. So I would have expected him to realize that there is uh, an aliasing happening and either issue a warning, maybe just if you turn it on, or not even do this um, mm -hmm. errorless that's optimization. A, that's a very good observation. In fact, uh, this is so. S there are two parts of this question, as far as I believe. One is why do why the compiler do not give a warning message, and one of the reasons is that the compiler has uh, several parts: front end, middle end, back end. And sometimes we do the alias analysis in the middle end, or or even in the back end, and at that point, there is no good way right now, at least within LLVM, to issue a warning to the user. So the front end do not have this information, and the middle end cannot warn you, basically. And uh, I think in case of the Microsoft's compiler, they issue some of the warnings from the back end. So the situation there might be different in the future, but I think right now they do not do optimizations based on uh, this type of async rule. And the other question, why the compiler does this transformation at all? Uh, it is kind of an artifact of the implementation. If you inline this code, the compiler will no longer do this transformation. So you, if you do the inlining by hand, but uh, so the compiler will notice that there is an aliasing there, and it will not use the type-based rules to eliminate the load from the memory. But the way how uh, alias, the, the way how type-based alias analysis is implemented uh, right now, the way, way how alias analysis is implemented in LLVM, there are multiple ways to do alias analysis, and. The first, they do it based on the data flow, and and in the, in the end, they do it based on the types. So in, in case, you, based on the data flow, you say that, okay, they are aliased, then the types will not be considered at all. But uh, basically, this data flow based alias analysis will not work across function calls right now. So it will say that I know nothing about the uh, whether these two pointers can alias or not. But if you inline this code into main, then you will, uh, then the compiler will no longer do this transformation. Okay, thank you. Okay, then thank you.